Uh, Dr. Kasim Laka, based on your uh, very wide international experience, what are, the, um, what are the conditions necessary for reform? Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would subscribe to several of the things that my colleague, colleagues on this panel have said. Um, if I had to summarize it in probably one sentence, the most important thing for bringing about reform, achieving reform, the name of our panel, uh, is to have a political will. You can, uh, you can train, uh, you, can profession, uh, uh, you, you can give professional development to the teachers, you can build new facilities, you can bring extraordinary facilities to the library, but if the political will is not there, we won't achieve these. And if we achieve them, they will be in fits and start. This government or this administration will support it. The next administration puts it on the back burner yeah. Yeah. and it doesn't happen. So how do we bring about this political? How do you bring about consistency is what you mean. And, and how do we have a long-term vision? And I think it's a, a very critical point. When President de Gaulle uh, uh, created a long-term vision for, or at least presented a long-term vision for France, he had three or four ideas that this is something that's going to be important. I mean, that's, that's something you hear from teachers, not just in Pakistan, but France, UK, everywhere, that you get a new minister for education, and suddenly you get a new initiative. That's right. An initiative is something that solves a problem for the day, right. and the problem goes away, but of course it doesn't. Well, so the problem is that ministers are usually elected for four or five years. They have given all kinds of speeches um, to the public, say, we promise you this. When it comes to delivery, they have to come along and deliver. The most difficult reforms to deliver today are education and health. Ask Dr. Mr. Obama, he will confirm all of that. Ask President Sarkozy, he will confirm it. And the point is that if we don't have political will that coalesces, now the way to create that political will is to give a vision for the longer term mobilize the public, but most of all, mobilize the faculty, mobilize those who are delivering uh, um, uh, education. And I, I just say this from my experience that uh, uh, in 2001, when uh, President Musharraf asked me to, to head a team that was uh, going to look at reforms in higher education, he said, I will support you. And I said, only thing I ask from you is political will. And he said, I'll stay with that. Uh, political support. Political support. And that then resulted in some money coming into education. But to create conditions for the politicians to, to, to support that, I had to go around with my colleagues to about 70 odd fora of faculty members, parents, students, and sit with them and mobilize a sense that we need to. And the biggest opponents at that time were the faculty members because they were unsure what will happen to them. Once you get well, them people, on board... People on the whole don't like change. They don't. Um, anybody else want to come in on, on this point? Because well, this I, is I, very important. So, just, Michael. Just, just on, the, on the political will point, just very briefly, I do think that is very important. And the, the, there are... Obviously, you can't... It, there's, there's no substitute for democracy, so it will sometimes throw up changes of government, of course. But I think you, you, there, there are two things. One is, in our McKinsey study, we showed that um, the, the most successful improving systems had political leaders in position for their education reform lasting about six years. If you look at the history of England, we've had a, a change of Secretary of Education, Secretary of State for Education, roughly every two years since 1945. Yeah. Uh, I've known exactly. 12 of them over a 24 year period, at least that, one of them this in the audience. This is my point entirely. Um, so that, that does make it difficult. And this is teacher's but, point but you entirely need, as well. Therefore, to get a national, in, in, the, in the 21st century, you need a national story about how education is part of the change of that country that transcends political parties. And then you need to get some results that give people confidence that you're on the right track. Uh, Jensik, do you want to come in? Yes. yes. Um, um, we have this, the same experience in Poland. Uh, I'm from NGO organization, and we've been able to state with our po consistent way, with our policy of educational change for 20 years. And at the same time, we have 10 ministers of education in Poland, which as, almost as a rule didn't follow their predecessor policies. So uh, we have to a little bit back up and start not to wait, especially as uh, educators, not to wait for government to initiate reforms. 
we have to do something very often by ourselves. Uh, and uh, it can be done on the beginning as an as a innovation in your school or establishing small, local, something new, but later to think about uh, how you can influence whole educational system with it. So to become someone to think about yourself who is uh, changing education from bottom up, not waiting for, because we have political will or we don't have, our politicians are under their own restraints. Okay, so what do you put your own success down to? The Polish school system is one of the en most envied in the world, isn't it, with the, with the, the PISA ratings that I was looking at? Um, and you did it by, what, creating a middle school idea? Yes, uh, it, it happened by, in fact, political will. It happened because politicians decided that we want to extend compulsory system, uh, make them longer for every student to be in the same compulsory system, before we divide them like for vocational schools and for acad acad academic more track of, uh, of learning. And uh, this is really role of central government to set up right system, but later to give space for other actors. And we've been talking about it, exactly. uh, other actors. Uh, a minister, you want to come in? Oui, je voudrais rebondir sur la méthode de la réforme. Vous disiez tout à l'heure, à juste titre, que la France avait un système très centralisé, historiquement très centralisé. Et euh, il faut bien imaginer qu'on ne peut pas tout réformer d'en haut en débloquant le système d'en haut. Et on a besoin aussi de donner des marges de manœuvre aux acteurs locaux et euh, de faire confiance grâce à l'expérimentation. Je crois beaucoup à l'expérimentation. Euh, en France, nous essayons de déployer les expérimentations dans des domaines très variés. Je, je vous prends un exemple. Nous avons euh, en ce moment euh, 300 collèges en France qui sont dorénavant autonomes dans le recrutement de leurs professeurs, dans leur projet pédagogique. Si j'avais dit euh, nous allons rendre autonomes 100% des collèges de France et nous allons faire recruter les professeurs par les chefs d'établissement, j'avais une mobilisation générale et le blocage du pays. Nous, avons, nous, sommes, nous passons par l'expérimentation, nous allons évaluer cette expérimentation et quelque chose me dit, l'enquête McKinsey que vous avez réalisée, que euh, cette direction n'est pas forcément la plus mauvaise. Indeed. Um, very, very briefly, Jansa, because I sort of moved on a bit. Uh, tell us a little about the Center for Citizen Education, um, Citizenship Education. Very briefly, just tell us what it does. Uh -huh. uh, we started about uh, 20 years ago with uh, realization that in Poland we need much more civic competency for young people. And we know that we wouldn't accomplish this through traditional teaching methods through just lecturing students and uh, testing them about if they understand the concept of democracy, for example, or uh, civic participation. We need projects which would put young people in, a, in their local community to do something uh, significant and they would learn by doing. So we start with variety of projects, first for civic and later for every school subject, because there is widely known that engagement of students is uh, very important for, for their ability to successfully lear learn, and this is what we are about. So to find instructions which can really empower students by exposing them for authentic learning possibilities. Thank you, Jens. The, the, the point of today is effective reform, how you achieve it. Uh, Tom Bentley, uh, you're working at the heart of government in Australia. Can you describe some current reforms there? Certainly. Um, and I, I might try and say uh, uh, briefly, you know, some of the characteristics which we're trying to develop, which I think might become features of, you know, the kind of next generation of system reforms and how we can, how we can make the models more effective. Um, one of the most important, possibly for me, the, the central uh, dimension of um, a system of education which is capable of learning from itself and continuously improving is transparency. Uh, and so in the long-term uh, reform strategy that the Australian government is, is pursuing, increasing transparency for professionals and policy makers, but also for the wider community is fundamental. So... What do you mean transparency? Between well, whom? The, 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 the core example that I'll describe um, is a website. 
So it's a use of digital technology to provide information to any user. It's, it's free to the public to give as much information as possible about the characteristics of each school and the performance of each school. And then year by year, as the technology and the analytics improve, also to be able to explain and present the progress of students and the ways in which to interpret that progress when comparing the school against other schools that serve similar communities uh, and to understand the value that teaching and school uh, uh, leadership might be adding to the, the progress of those students. So in Australia, which is a, you know, a well-developed country with a relatively high performing school system, nonetheless, when, when this government, federal government came to office, uh, all these kids going to school and all these parents having basically similar experience but no common base of information about how those schools were resourced, what was happening in them or, or how they might be performing. So it's a simple website called My School uh, but it took a lot of political negotiation to win agreement from all the relevant authorities, the non-government school systems, the, the states because Australia is federal in order to bring that about. And th but it, uh, the, the, the innovation, the kind of structural change that uh, uh, w was um, created then allows a much more evolutionary change to keep happening, which central governments don't have to try and drive every detail of because people can access this information and then decide what use they want to so make So reforms through the website? Yeah. Virtual reform? It, it's, a, it's a way of enabling uh, yeah. reform and innovation by helping to connect together these different efforts and enabling people to think about how specific initiatives might be translated into larger scale change. Okay. Do you want to make a point before we move on? I'd like to um, support that idea uh, and I would like to suggest two types of reforms that especially in developing countries uh, we have seen make a major difference. One uh, relates to the governance structures, whether it's schools or universities. Where governance does not work, then the head of the school or head of the university is not able to be held accountable and so the faculty and so forth. There is a saying I'm told in Chinese that a bad fish smells at the head. If you want to buy a fish, you smell at the head. If it is smelly, you know it is bad. So it starts at the governance. It's, it's, it's no good us putting another library or another physical facility if the accountability and performance mechanism is not there. The second one is at a much lower level, and yet it is at a much broader level, and in developing countries, because many delegates are here from developing countries, I have found that the examination system in many countries is weak. Why is it weak? because the examination system tests memory, tests for rote learning ability. Whereas a good exam system will want you to look at not just the, uh, the, the factual knowledge, but its application and conceptualization. And to bring that change, the Aga Khan University, I'm just giving you a specific example, presented to the government of Pakistan a plan to have its own examination system. And that was done about 15 years ago. It took 10 years of different administrations to say this looks like a good idea, but it never moved up because the public sector examination systems were not effective and they were opposing. Once the new private sector examination came in eventually, that became a role model. So the okay. bottom line is create good role models, create good benchmarks, and you may be able to get better reforms. That was far and wide ranging, uh, Professor. But